As Karen said a moment ago, I, I've been fortunate to write about 17 books now. And I have, for most of those books, been on tour. And I have always insisted, with every publisher that I've been with, I've always insisted, as I did this time, that Seattle be on my tour stop list. And so I'm glad. Yeah. Always, always honored and humbled indeed to be back in this great city. And I certainly want to start tonight by thanking KUOW. I say this all the time, and for those who've seen me at Town Hall or other places in this great city over the years, you've heard me say this so many times. And is Jeff Hansen still in the room somewhere? There he is to my left. Uh, Karen is the general manager at uh, KUOW. Jeff Hansen's been there for quite a while as the program director, and it is never, ever lost on me. I never, ever lose sight of the fact or ever forget that when I first signed up for my show on NPR at the time, and as many of you know, I was the first African-American in the history of NPR to have his own daily radio program. So now there are other African-Americans who've come through the door, but I was the first to have his own program daily on NPR. It shows you how far America still has to go, that I was the first Negro through the door uh, just a few years ago, essentially, uh, to have his first, uh, have his own program, signature program, heard on NPR across the nation five days a week. And I want you to know, as I say every time I come to the city, that the very first station to sign up to carry that program was KUOW in Seattle. <laughs> so Jeff Hansen, I thank you for being on my side all those years later. And Seattle became a sort of test market for what we could do on public radio. Um, by challenging folk to re-examine the assumptions they hold, by helping them to expand their inventory of ideas, by using this public radio platform to introduce Americans to each other. Seattle becomes sort of a test ground, and I guess they figured if it worked in Seattle, it might work someplace else. So because it worked so well in this city, other stations started to pick it up, and here I am all these years later uh, because KUOW in Seattle gave me a shot. So thank you again, Seattle, for, um, for, for being there all those years ago. Let me um, jump right into talking about this book and why the timing of this uh, text I think is so propitious. And I certainly want to leave good time at the end for your questions and comments. I say all the time that part of what's wrong with our country is that we are so often engaged in monologue and not often enough engaged in dialogue. And I certainly want to learn from you tonight and answer your questions to the best of my ability, but uh, I'm sure hear your comments as well that might enlighten, encourage, and empower and inspire me uh, for the rest of this tour. So I want to get to that Q&A as quickly as I can, but let me just take some time to give you a sense of why this book, I think, is so, so critically important. As you all know, and it's what I love about coming to Seattle, y'all are such a smart group of people in Seattle. So well read, and I just love coming here to have these rich conversations. So as most of you in this room already know, Dr. King has three principal biographers, Taylor Branch, David Garrell, and Claiborne Carson. And there is no way I want to acknowledge every time I step to a microphone on this tour, I want to acknowledge that there's no way that this book, Death of a King, could have been written if Branch and Garrow and Carson had not done the heavy lifting um, of bringing to us the life and rich legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So I couldn't have written my text without them having done all the work they've done. And yet, up until this book, no book has ever looked at the last year of Dr. King's life, literally the last year, the last 365 days of his life, from April 4, 1967 to April 4, 1968. That year is critical, my friends, because I believe that for every one of us in this room, and I'm glad that this place is just packed in here tonight, I'm humbled by that, but for every one of us in this room, for everyone listening or watching beyond this room tonight, we get to know who we really are, we come to know who we truly are, in the dark and difficult days of our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what I thought. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's not just that we learn who we are, but can I tell you something else? You learn who's ride or die, as we say in my neighborhood. You learn who's going to be faithful unto death. You learn who's with you until the end when you go through the dark and difficult days of your life. And so if you think you know Dr. King, but you don't know him in the dark and difficult days of his life, then you really respectfully don't know Dr. King. And most of us uh, American citizens have no idea of what the dark and difficult days were like for Dr. King. Why? Because most of us, I'm in Seattle, so this is nobody in this room, but, but, but most Americans, I believe, think Dr. King only gave 
one speech <laughs> in his whole life. And then they think the speech only had one line in it. <laughs> that I want my children to live in a nation where they'll not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I ain't gonna ask you to go no further, because I know that's all you know. So I think we think, we, 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 we act like King only gave one speech in his life, it had one line in it, and then the next day they shot and killed him. That's not exactly how this went. Um, and so, for so many of us, we have King frozen in this frame of 1963 August at the March on Washington, delivering that I have a dream speech. I was in Memphis the other day on tour and what an honor it was, and it was a rough uh, and emotional night for me. I've been there so many times, but it was, a, it was an amazing honor to have been invited back to Memphis, to the National Civil Rights Museum, where Dr. King was assassinated on that balcony at the Lorraine Motel, August 4, 1968. So I was asked to come back with this particular book about his life and to lecture at that museum and, of course, uh, uh, spent time on my knees uh, in, in, in thanksgiving for the life and legacy of Dr. King on the spot where he was assassinated uh, almost 50 years ago at the Lorraine Motel. Um, I raise that only because when I was in Memphis the other night, I said to the audience of Memphians, uh, so many Americans believe Dr. King only gave one speech in his whole life, but in Memphis, y'all know that he at least gave two speeches. <laughs> For you historians, you get that joke. Um, Dr. King gave the mountaintop speech. I may not get that with you the night before he died in Memphis. So I said to Memphians, y'all know that he gave at least two talks in his life. Um, but we have Dr. King frozen in this sort of frame of 1963. King dies far too young at the age of 39, but he does live five years after I have a dream. And in that five-year period, he evolves, uh, he changes, he has a different view on life, on America, and that is the part of his life that we have yet to come to terms with. So in 1963, King is talking about his dream but by the time this book starts, April of 67, he's saying publicly that that dream has become a nightmare. So it's a dream in 63 and 67, it's a nightmare. In 63, he's talking about and fighting for integration. By 67, he is saying uh, to Harry Belafonte and others that I believe for all that we have done to fight for integration, I believe that we have integrated into a burning house. This is King in 67 that we've integrated into a burning house. In 63, he's talking about a dream and trying to hold America uh, to its highest ideals. He has, a, uh, if not an optimism, certainly a hope that America can become a nation as good as its promise. And that's all we want in America, uh, is to live in a country that's as good as its promise. The reality is then and even now that the gap between the promise of America and the possibility in America for all our citizens, that gap is still too wide. So Martin is, again, if not optimistic, certainly hopeful about the future of America in 1963. Let me jump ahead and I'll come back. I warn you right now, hold on to your seats. Strap yourselves down for just a second here. In 63, Martin is hopeful about America. He's assassinated on a Thursday night in Memphis on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel. One of the last calls he makes from the Lorraine, as you'll see in this text, is back to his church, Ebenezer, in Atlanta, that he co-pastored with his father, Daddy King. King is on the road all the time. But every Thursday or Friday, he calls in the sermon he's going to preach on Sunday morning, so they have time to get it typed up into the Sunday morning bulletin. So when you show up on Sunday morning, they hand you the bulletin with the order of services and the sermon that Dr. King is going to preach that Sunday morning. So one of the last calls he makes from the Lorraine Motel is back to his church and he tells his secretary and tells his father that come Sunday morning, had he lived, he was going to preach a sermon entitled, Why America May Go to Hell. That was the sermon topic on Sunday, had he lived. Why America May Go to Hell. May is the operative word here. He didn't say America was going to hell. He didn't declare America. Uh, he didn't say go to hell, America. The sermon was going to be why America may go to hell. 
His thesis was that if we don't get serious about what he'd been talking about for the year prior, as he called it, the triple threat of racism, poverty, and militarism. Martin called it the triple threat of racism, poverty, and militarism. If we don't get serious about this triple threat facing our country, we're simply going to lose our democracy. And America may just go to hell. Now, when you tell the average American that the I have a dream man was going to preach a sermon called Why America May Go to Hell, they have a hard time juxtaposing these two persons. They can't quite figure that out. That's because we don't have any real understanding of who King becomes from 1963 to 1967. So he's dead April 4, 1968. Had he lived a few more days, he was going to preach this sermon, Why America May Go to Hell. The thesis again was that we've got to get serious about this triple threat of racism and poverty and militarism. So let's back up a year to April 4, 1967, the year prior, when King introduces this notion. So this book is about the last year of his life, April 4, 67, when he gives this speech in New York at the Riverside Church called Beyond Vietnam. He's dead literally one year to the day later, April 4, 68. And this is what this text is all about. Just that last year, who has Martin Luther King Jr. become? What is he up against? What kind of hell and hate is he having to, to, to navigate every day? And how does he get up every day and continue to tell his truth with everything coming at him? So it's April 4, 1967. Martin goes to New York to the Riverside Church and gives a speech called Beyond Vietnam. He'd been on the record already opposed to the war in Vietnam, but had not come out and given a major speech explaining his position and declaring that he was publicly against the war in Vietnam. And so Riverside Church becomes the place. April 4, 67 is the date. Everybody in his camp, except James Bevel, tells him, Martin, do not give this speech. We have to stay focused on civil rights and human rights and voting rights. You're about to get off on a tangent. You're going to mess up everything we have worked for. You're going to anger the president who's been good to us on voting rights and civil rights, Lyndon Johnson, who we have worked with. They gave Martin a litany of reasons why Martin should not give this speech. And Martin got to that podium at the Riverside Church and said, I come to this place tonight because my conscience leaves me no other choice. Martin says that night that silence is betrayal. Sometimes silence is betrayal. And so I've come to this house tonight to speak out against the war in Vietnam. And then he uses a phrase that got him in a world of trouble. He says that night that America, my country, is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. The greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Now let me contextualize that for you. First of all, as you well know, you couldn't get away saying that today <laughs> without catching some hell. But imagine, this is Dr. King. Yes, he's Dr. King. Yes, he's a Nobel laureate, Nobel Peace Prize recipient. But this is still Dr. King, a black man. I want to contextualize this. You got a black man in the 60s who white folk have given license to talk about civil rights, but ain't nobody asked his opinion on foreign policy. What they're saying is, Negro, we gave you license. We gave you the, the freedom and the right to talk about civil rights, but ain't nobody told you you can talk about foreign policy. Stay in your lane. This foreign policy is none of your business. That's what they're saying to Martin, basically. Martin is saying, hold up, I'm against violence here, I'm against violence there, I'm against violence everywhere. So you got Martin King, black man in the 60s, who's already repeatedly by Hoover and the FBI been labeled and called a communist, who stands up at the height of the Vietnam War and says to America, you, America, you are the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Inside the hall, inside the beautiful edifice Riverside, as I look around this wonderful edifice, Martin had seven standing ovations. Applause all throughout the night. The speech was deliciously received. 
on that night. But oh, come the next morning. They went after him with a vengeance. They vilified King the next day. I believe, and I suspect you believe as well, that there is no such thing as an overnight success. But I also equally believe that you can go from being a success to being persona non grata overnight. One day you're on top of the world, the next day you're being crushed by the world. So no such thing as an overnight success. It doesn't work this way, but it can work that way. It can turn on you real fast. And that's what happened to Dr. King. One day he's Dr. King, and the next day he is out of step and out of touch, and everybody in America turns on him the next morning. Now, I was on Fox News the other night talking about this book, and I walked out of the studio, and I kind of chuckled to myself just thinking, what would Fox News have said? <laughs> What would Rush Limbaugh have said? What would Glenn Beck have said? What would Fox News have done to him the day after he declared that America was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today? Now, Fox News wasn't around then, but that's okay because the liberal media establishment did their job. The liberal media establishment. When you read this text, Death of a King, and you see what the New York Times said about him, it's embarrassing. When you read what the liberal Washington Post said about him, it's going to upset you and make you mad. When you read about what Time Magazine said about him that week, it might even make you cry. The liberal media turned on him quicker than right now and sooner than at once. They turned so fast on him his head was spinning. He woke up, the, woke up the next morning and every major newspaper, every major news outlet in this country was skewering him the very next day. So first, after giving that speech, the media turns on him. And then the White House turns on him. Martin has worked with Lyndon Johnson, as I intimated earlier, to get the two most important and I think seminal pieces of legislation in the entire 20th century passed, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. So he's worked with Johnson to get both of these acts passed into law. But now he's butting heads. He's going tete a tete with Lyndon Johnson. And for most Negroes in the country, Johnson has been the best friend that Negroes have had in the White House since Lincoln freed the slaves because he worked so assiduously to get the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act passed. And now Martin is butting heads with Lyndon Johnson. Martin is saying to the president, Mr. President, you called for a war on poverty. I support you in that. But now you're engaged on a war in Vietnam. And Martin is saying that, Mr. President, budgets are moral documents. I love that. Budgets are moral documents. If I can quote that great philosopher, <clears throat> budgets are moral documents. If I can quote that great philosopher, Jay-Z, <laughs> you can say what you say, but you are what you are. And when you put your budget on the table and we see your priorities, then we know who you really are and what really matters to you because budgets are moral documents, Mr. President. That's what Martin is saying to Lyndon Johnson. He's saying to Lyndon Johnson that war is the enemy of the poor. War is the enemy of the poor. The bombs that you're dropping in Vietnam are landing in the ghettos and barrios of America's cities. That's what he's saying to Lyndon Johnson. Johnson don't want to hear it. So the White House turns on him after uh, the media has already turned on him. And then white America turns on Dr. King. Hold your seats again. The last poll taken in King's life, the Harris poll found that 75%, nearly three quarters of the American people thought that Dr. King was irrelevant in the last year of his life. I know your head is spinning out, you're having a hard time trying to juxtapose the way we have, how might I put this, deified him in death with the way we demonized him at the end of his life. But those are the facts. Three quarters of the American people thought he was irrelevant in the last year of his life. So the media has turned on him. The White House has turned on him. Johnson continues to meet with other black leaders, but Martin is now disinvited to the White House. 
And then white America turns on him. And if that's not bad enough, then his own people turned on him. Almost 60% of black people thought he was irrelevant and a persona non grata. Almost 60% of his own people. And let me unpack that for you. When I say his own people, I mean, as you'll see in this text, that Roy Wilkins and the NAACP come out publicly against Dr. King. I'm talking about Whitney Young and the Urban League who come out publicly and castigate Dr. King. I'm talking about Adam Clayton Powell Jr., congressman, who comes out publicly to disrespect Dr. King. There's a story in this text that it pains me to even reference where Adam Clayton Powell Jr. affords Dr. King to his face, to his face, the ugliest kind of disrespect that I could ever imagine. When you read in this text what Adam Clayton Powell Jr. did and said to Dr. King's face, you're not going to believe it. And then Ralph Bunch, the only other black Nobel recipient, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, the only other black male, King was and still is the youngest to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, but Ralph Bunch had one as well. Ralph Bunch turns publicly against Dr. King. Now I know I lost you on that one, because you're thinking, like I was thinking when I did the research, how is it that this Negro, Ralph Bunch, has the same Peace Prize that Martin has, and yet he turns on Martin publicly when Martin comes out opposed to a war. Hello? You have a peace prize. How are you butting heads with Martin when he's opposed to war? I, don't, I, di I didn't get it in the research and I don't get it now, but it goes to show you how much hell and hate King was catching from everybody at that time. If that's not bad enough, Ralph Bunch is on the board of directors for the NAACP with Roy Wilkins. They decided to pass a resolution to condemn Martin King and release that resolution publicly. When Ralph Bunch saw the resolution, the language wasn't demeaning enough, it wasn't tough enough for him, he made the language even worse. He rewrote the resolution to make it tougher and more damning for Dr. King. So Bunch turns on him publicly. Carl Rowan, one of the most famous black journalists of that era, turns on him publicly, writes a scathing piece in Reader's Digest. you see it in the text. Scathing piece he writes about Dr. King. And then the black media starts to turn against Dr. King. And I can't even tell you at Town Hall tonight, I would dare not quote, but it's in the book, what Thurgood Marshall, yes, that Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> I can't even quote for you because the language is just too spicy and too saucy. Can't even tell you what Thurgood Marshall said about King, but you'll read it. I will tell you this. I can quote this part. Thurgood Marshall called Martin Luther King Jr. a boy on a man's errand. The worst thing then and the worst thing today you can ever call a black man is what? A boy. Thurgood Marshall called Martin Luther King Jr. a boy on a man's errand. And that's the nicest thing he said as you'll see in the text. It gets worse from there. So the media has turned on him. The White House has turned on him. White America has turned on him. Black America has turned on him. And then inside his own organization, King can't get a consensus from his own team to support his position against the war in Vietnam. His own board of directors at SCLC, his board of directors, passes a resolution to condemn him. He's on board, condemning him on his position on the war. If that's not bad enough, King had no idea that his treasurer, his treasurer, James Harrison, was a paid FBI informant. His photographer was a paid FBI informant. So he's got folk inside his camp with him every day who are reporting back to Hoover and the FBI every day reporting on what's happening on the inside. So he's being, he's being betrayed and obstructed and catching hell and hate from the inside by his team, which he referred to as a team of wild horses. That's his description of his own team, a team of wild horses. They don't agree with him on the position, his position on Vietnam, and he can't get them to support him on his poor people's campaign that he's trying to get off the ground. 
So he's catching hell and hate on the inside, catching hell and hate from the outside, and on top of that, he knows, he feels the death angel hovering in his face. He knows he's living on borrowed time. He knows there's a bullet out there with his name on it. He knows the death threats are coming every single day. He knows his time is limited. And yet, two hours before Martin walks out on that balcony to be assassinated, he says, I'd rather be dead than be afraid. Not knowing two hours later he, in fact, would be dead. I'd rather be dead than be afraid. Martin says repeatedly, a man who has not found something for which he's willing to die is not yet fit to live. Martin says repeatedly, I'd like to live a long life, but it's not about how long you live, it's about how well you live. Martin says repeatedly that the only thing that we have control over is not where we die or when we die or how we die, we only control what we die for. Not the where, the when, or the how. We only control what we die for. So with all this swirling around him, Martin King has to get up every day and somehow muster the courage and the conviction and the commitment to still speak his truth. Now again, all these years later, we know that King was right. And so as I said earlier, we've deified him and beatified him in, in, in death. But we gave him hell in the last years of his life. As hard as this is to say, as hard as it is to say, I'm gonna say it anyway, because I believe it with every fiber of my being. In a very real way, we helped to kill Dr. King. It's a strong indictment. But we helped to kill him. And we helped to kill him because we abandoned him in the dark, difficult, desolate days. We abandoned him. We abandoned him. And so now we're honoring him on the cheap, as it were, with the holidays and the monuments and the posted stamp. His name is on schools, streets, and libraries. His name is everywhere now. We're honoring him on the cheap. But we have yet to come to terms with the truth he was trying to tell, perhaps because it was then and is still now too subversive for us to handle. The truth he was trying to tell us about that triple threat facing our democracy would still exist. Racism, poverty, and militarism. What did we just see on display in Ferguson, Missouri weeks ago? Racism, <laughs> poverty, and militarism. And so we still yet to come to terms with the truth he was trying to tell. So Martin is waking up every day trying to put one foot in front of the other. One day, there's a story in the book, one day he wakes up, gets dressed, fully dressed, puts his suit and tie, socks and shoes on, and he can't get out the door. He walks back, gets back in, the, walks back in, gets back in the bed, fully clothed, shoes and all, gets back in the bed, pulls the covers over his head, and he cries and cries and cries until he falls asleep. He's drinking a little bit more than he should. He's smoking a little bit more than he should. He's gaining weight. Let me advance and I'll come back. The autopsy on his body in 68 found that while he was dead at 39, he had the organs, the insides of an almost 65 year old man. The pressure and the stress was eating him alive. And yet every day he got up and continued to tell the inconvenient, uncomfortable, unconventional, unhousing truth. He did it every day with all that going on. There were times at night Martin couldn't sleep in the last year of his life. As you read in the text, he couldn't sleep. One night, they were in a hotel, 3 o'clock in the morning. Ralph Abernathy wakes up and goes to King's room and he can't find him. King is not in the bed. And Ralph gets scared because the death threats have been really extreme, number one. But number two, Martin has been depressed and a little despondent. And as you'll read in the text, Martin had mania, had a bit of mania. Um, and the psychiatrists tell us today that for those folk who have that kind of mania that Martin had, it helps develop in them a sort of radical empathy. Makes sense to me, makes sense to you? Because they themselves are so... Um, they're struggling with this, their own sense of mortality and their own mania, it actually makes them uh, have a greater sense of empathy for other people. So that mania can lead to a sort of radical empathy. And there's a book coming out next year about Dr. King 
that's going to be very controversial, a psychological profile of him by a Tufts professor who makes that argument that what allowed him to have that sort of radical empathy was the mania that he suffered. He was depressed and despondent. There were days in the last year of his life he's hospitalized for what they said was exhaustion, and to be sure he was exhausted, but he also had that, that, that depression and despondency he was dealing with. You read in the text that when Martin was 12 years of age, he tried to kill himself. As a young child, he tried to commit suicide. I won't spoil the read for you, but you read what happened at 12 relative to his grandmother that made him feel responsible. And he goes up to the rooftop of their house and jumped off and tried to kill himself. Thankfully, he lived, but he had that sort of radical empathy even from the time he was just a child. And so Martin is trying to love his way through this, but there are times he can't even sleep. And so because they knew that Martin was suffering from this depression and knew the death threats were real, Ralph got scared at three in the morning when he can't find Dr. King. He's not in the bed, not in the bathroom, not in the room, can't find him anywhere. Ralph starts to panic. Then he realized that King was staying in a room that had a balcony that went around to the other side of the room. And he walks out around the corner and there's Martin standing in his pajamas, looking out at the ocean at three in the morning, singing a song called Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. He knew his time was limited. Rock of Ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And Ralph can't convince Martin to go back to his room because Martin can't sleep and he's just singing his way through this night. Ralph goes back to bed, comes back at eight o'clock in the morning. Martin is still standing in the same place, in his pajamas, singing Rock of Ages, cleft for me. In the book, you'll see that in the last year of his life, Martin is singing and preaching and praying and pushing and pulling his way through this last year. But every day, he's still committed, no matter what he had to do. There was talks in his camp. You'll read about this. There was a talk, there was a meeting in New York one night amongst his uh, inner circle. And the conversation centered around whether or not they could convince Dr. King to see a therapist, to see a therapist. And it never happened, and I won't spoil the read. You'll see why it didn't happen. But that conversation happens inside his own camp. They're concerned about Martin. But Martin is telling them that he's of sound mind. He's telling them that my time is limited. I'm not going to be around here much longer. And Coretta doesn't want to hear that. His inner circle doesn't want to hear that. They, how do you tell somebody that you're about to leave them? They don't want to hear that. But Martin knows that his time is almost up. And that's why he's working so aggressively to get that Poor People's Campaign off the ground. We think of Occupy and we think of New York and Zuccotti Park. Martin wasn't going to Zuccotti Park. He wasn't going to New York. He was going to be the original Occupy, but he was going to the nation's capital. And he and thousands of others were going to camp out on the National Mall in a tent city they called Resurrection City. He was going to stay there and live there until they embarrassed Congress to do something about the issue of poverty in this country. Memphis was a test case. He was in Memphis to work with the sanitation workers, as you know, on the issue of income inequality and poverty. And that was a test case. But he was on his way to Washington. And they knew that when Martin got to Washington, it was going to be a major embarrassment for the country. And they killed him before he got there. They didn't want that level of embarrassment. Consider this, J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, in the last year of Martin's life, has Martin listed as the most dangerous man in America. Hear that. Martin Luther King Jr., the FBI and Hoover declare, is the most dangerous man in America. Seattle, I ask you, how is it that you can be the most dangerous man in all of America when the only weapon that you are using is love. The most dangerous man in America and your only weapon is love. I think that says something even today about the power and the potency of this thing called love. And let me offer you a Kingian definition, I'll wrap this up. A Kingian definition of what love is. 
We could have a whole other conversation on another night. Maybe we'll come back one day and talk about this. But there's a great conversation to be had in Seattle about whatever happened to the notion of love in our public discourse. Whatever happened to the notion of love in our public discourse. King put love in the public square. Gandhi put love in the public square. Bobby Kennedy put love in the public square. Mandela put love in the public square. Whatever happened to the notion of love in our public discourse? And by love, all we mean is simply this, that everybody is worthy, that all life has the same equal and precious value. We are all equally worthy just because. Just because. Just because. That's what we mean. We mean that when we say love. We're all worthy just because. Everybody's somebody's child. Everybody's somebody's kid. It matters not how many degrees you have, where you went to school, how much money you make, what kind of car you drive, what your zip code is, who your mom and them are, what your last name is, how much access you have, what kind of hookup you have, who you know, that the color of your skin, that is irrelevant. Every one of us is equally worthy. All life is precious and has the same value. Nobody's any better than you. Nobody's any worse than you. Life has the same value just because. We're all worthy just because. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine how different our country would be, how transformational it would be if we could ever take that definition and operationalize it? implementize it in our public policy? Are y'all still with me? If everybody's worthy just because, that means everybody ought to have a job with a living wage. If everybody is worthy, if everybody's worthy just because, everybody ought to have access to high quality health care. If everybody is worthy just because, Everybody ought to have access to, us to an access to an equal, high quality education. If everybody is worthy just because, uh, y'all, y'all ain't feeling me on this. That would fundamentally change our nation. If we could ever operationalize that Kingian definition of love that everybody is equally worthy just because. And so that's why Martin is up every day trying to love and serve people. I have a simple definition of leadership. I told an audience today at Microsoft, if you call yourself a leader and look behind and ain't nobody following you, you just out for a walk. <laughs> you, just, you, just, <laughs> you just out getting some exercise. But leadership is this. Here's my definition. And when I think of it, I think of King as Exhibit A, the quintessential example of my definition of leadership. You can't lead people unless you love people. And you can't save people unless you serve people. That's leadership. You can't lead if you don't love. You can't save if you don't serve. So if you would call yourself a leader or would be a leader, all I care about is one, what is the depth of your love for everyday people? And secondly, what is the quality of your service to them? What's the depth of your love? What's the quality of your service? That's what leadership is all about, loving and serving people. And by that definition, I regard Dr. King, and I dedicate this text to Martin Luther King Jr., America's greatest democratic, small d, America's greatest democratic public intellectual. So all these years later, we still don't know who Martin King really was. And that's what this book is all about, taking you inside the dark and difficult days of his life, which happened to be for him the last year where he had to wrestle with who he really was and what kind of immutable principles he was really going to live his final days by. And so I hope that, like me, when you read this text, if you think you love Martin, if you think you respect Dr. King, oh, you're gonna really love him. When you see how he navigated through this last year with all that hell and all that hate coming at him, he never bowed, he wouldn't bend, he wouldn't break. And if you love him now, you're really gonna love him when you see what he went through with all that hell and hate coming at him in the last year. I close on this note. It's not just to look back at the history of the last year of his life, but I hope and believe that this book will also be a cautionary tale for those of us who are alive today. Why cautionary tale, Tavis? Glad you asked. (laughs) 
There's a huge price that our society pays, a huge price that we pay, when we ignore our truth tellers. We pay a heavy price when we ignore our truth tellers. And in Seattle and beyond, there are truth tellers every day trying to get us to deal with the truth of what we're doing to the environment. Global warming and climate change, that's not a joke. But we are turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to the truth tellers among us who are trying to get us to get serious about the environment. We're turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to the truth tellers who are trying to get us to see that poverty is now threatening our very democracy. That poverty is now a matter of national security. 1% of the people cannot continue to own and control 40% of the wealth. The top 400 richest Americans, 400 individuals, have wealth equivalent to the bottom 150 million of us. These days there's a sidewalk, there's a highway, a highway into poverty, but barely a sidewalk out. That's what we're dealing with today. One out of two Americans is either in or near poverty. You've got the perennially poor, you've got the near poor, and you've got the new poor. And the new poor are the former middle class. We, these numbers are not sustainable. Call it a plutocracy, call it an oligarchy, but this ain't no democracy. And these numbers are not sustainable. We ignore the truth tellers talking about income inequality and poverty. We ignore the truth tellers talking about immigration. And while meaningful reform has to happen, we ignore the truth tellers about this drone program on steroids. We ignore those truth tellers as well. There's a huge price that our society pays when we ignore the truth tellers. So this is not just my love letter to Martin King, although it is indeed my love letter to him. But it's also a cautionary tale. When I was 12 years of age, I was brutally beaten. As I discuss in my text, what I know for sure, one of my previous books, my father snapped one night, and I was so brutally beaten as a 12-year-old kid that I was in the hospital for two weeks, two weeks in traction. And for some reason, I don't know why to this day, a member of my church, a member of the church came to visit me, and he brought me a box, and the box contained nothing but LPs. Turns out that Barry Gordy of Motown fame had the good sense to send an engineer around to follow Dr. King as he was giving speeches. And he recorded a lot of those speeches. And years later, Gordy put a lot of those speeches out on LP. And this deacon in my church was collecting those LPs. And for whatever reason, I do not know why, he came to me and gave me this gift box with all these recordings in it. And when I got out of that hospital, And I heard the love in his heart and the hope in his soul. It gave me a reassurance. I was mad at everybody. I hated my father. I hated my mother. I hated the world. I've been accused of something that I hadn't done. My father never even asked me had I done it. The minister of my church stood up in front of the entire congregation and just <laughs> demonized me. Demonized me in front of the whole church. I didn't know what he was even talking about. My father snapped, and what happened, happened. He got arrested and had to go to court and all of that. When I heard King's voice, he was talking to an entire nation about the power of love. Not the love of power, but about the power of love. King was saying that love is the only force in the world capable of turning an enemy into a friend. King was talking to the country, but he might as well have been talking to a 12-year-old broken-hearted, broken-spirited boy broken boned boy named Tavis. And what I heard King saying to me is that love is your only option. That you're gonna to have to find a way to love your way through this. That hatred and bitterness and revenge, Tavis, are not options if you wanna live a life of meaning and purpose and value. And since I was 12, all I've tried to do is my small part, and this book is another down payment on that, just tried to make the world safe for his legacy. 
I turned 50 a few weeks ago, and I told my publisher, Little Brown, last year, I didn't want this book out in January around his birthday. I didn't want it out in February in Black History Month. I didn't want to black an eye, Dr. King. I didn't want it out in April around his assassination anniversary because I believe that his martyrdom has undermined his message. And so I don't want to get caught up in trying to celebrate a text that gets caught up in all that celebration and, and pomp and circumstance. But I wanted the book to come out in September for two reasons. One, I would have a clear lane, unobstructed by all these holidays and celebrations, to get you and get us to focus on who Martin King was, absent all the other hoopla. That's the first reason. But the second reason was, it's my love letter to Dr. King. I wouldn't have made it to 50 if he had not saved my life at the age of 12. He'd long since been dead, but he really brought me back to life when I was a 12-year-old kid. And all I can tell you is that from that day until now, I've been doing my small part. When you hear me on radio or see me on television or any place else, all I'm trying to do is my small part to make the world safe for his legacy. And what is that legacy? Justice for all, service to others, and a love that liberates people. Justice for all, service to others, and a love that liberates people. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it.